Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. And neither I or um, Kitty imagined that um, 20 years after I suggested that Dan Hobbs should come and assist him in his work, we would be here in an international gentle teaching conference. So I'm very, very proud to have been the person to um, introduce uh, gentle teaching to Iceland. And what I'm going to talk about is um, gentle teaching and human rights. But um, I will start with a bit of a personal background to let you uh, have some insight into why I entered the field of disability and um, how, I, how my uh, first acquaintance with uh, gentle teaching um, uh, came about. Um, actually, um, my father um, was disabled, so I grew up with a disability. He had um, a work accident um, when I was a very young child and became partly paralyzed, so disability has always been a part of my life. And then when I was a teenager, I, I got a summer job, like most kids in Iceland or young people in Iceland. Um, working in institutions, and um, uh, somehow I thought that was, um, it, it touched me, so I decided that I would continue and working with um, disabled people, um, and uh, I got a training, uh, a professional training in working with disabled people, and worked in institutions for, um, and other services um, for a number of years. And I really um, try to um, get change in the... First, I thought, we have to change the institution. And then, um, like many other people, I realized the institutions cannot be changed. They have to be closed. So I took part in that struggle. And it was a very difficult struggle. And it did not succeed, really. And um, so... Um, the lessons I learned from that struggle was that if you want to promote change in policy and services, you need the people who have power to listen to you. And you really need to be knowledgeable about what you are, um, uh, about your cause. It is not enough to have a burning desire to change. You have to know something, have a sound knowledge base. And I really didn't have that. I just knew that the institution was wrong. And, I, I, and also, you have to have credentials to um, help people listen to you. And I thought that um, a university degree would help people listen to me. I decided to get a university degree as a hearing aid for other people. It may not be the best reason, but that's what I did. So I decided to get more education so I would know better what I was doing. And I went to Syracuse University um, in the US. I was at a place called uh, Center on Human Policy, which was a very progressive and um, innovative place at the time. Um, perhaps one of the most um, innovative centers internationally. Um, so I was incredibly fortunate to be there. I was there for six years, and I got my doctoral degree in disability studies and women's studies. And the reason I went there was really Wolf Wolfensperger, whom I had known about and had been, I had been teaching his um, work in Iceland. But there were some incredible important mentors and leaders in the field of disability at Syracuse. And one of them was Burton Blatt, another one was Steve Taylor, who became a very close friend of mine, and he passed away um, a couple of years ago. And Gunnar Dybbott, also, who was an internationally um, very well known for rallying people around the world around the issue of disability. How many people in, the, in this room know anything about these men or have heard about them? Some, yeah. These are, I would say, um, very, very important leaders in, um, in our field. And perhaps the greatest thinker and more influential is Wolfensperger. But that's another story. So during my first year at Syracuse, 
I was introduced to gentle teaching. Um, it was through a chapter I, I read that was written by John McGee and um, Dan Hobbs. And um, it was presented at the time as an alternative approach to work with um, disabled people and in particular to work with people who had very significant and challenging difficult behaviors. Um, at the time, uh, behavior modification was sort of mainstream um, approach and um, the way it was and probably still is practiced in the US is incredibly punitive and very harsh and there, Syracuse was among many places in the US that tried to introduce and promote and learn about and teach about alternative approaches to behavior modification. Um, and one of the um, approaches I was introduced to was um, gentle teaching. And uh, it happened so that um, a close friend of mine who was doing the doctoral studies program with me, her name is Barbara Ayers, um, we lived together, three doctoral students, for five years, and a very close friend of hers was called Daniel Hobbs, who is one of the early leaders in um, gentle teaching. And through her, um, Dan Hobbs was invited to come to Syracuse, and I got to know him personally, and he stayed at our house, and I took a few workshops and courses with him, both in Syracuse and in other places. And I must say that I have not been a gentle teaching uh, practitioner myself in uh, the field of disability or in services, but I have benefited very, very much from using the gentle teaching approach in my own personal life with my, you know, children and grandchildren. So um, while it has been introduced as a... Um, um, a good way to um, assist people's, people whose um, behaviors are maybe out of control. It works just as well with your grandkids. Really, it does. So what I learned from um, my lessons from Syracuse um, uh, was that academia can really be a place where people work for social justice and change. And I, I met many important visionaries of change who worked within the academia, but were advocates and allies and worked closely with disabled people and their associations um, and, um, you know, sort of in an act activist um, way. And I learned that research and scholarship can really be used to bring about and support change. And I wanted very much to bring that kind of scholarship um, back to Iceland. At the time, there was very little um, tradition of the university working with anyone outside um, the university walls, really. And so before I finished my, my studies at Syracuse, I um, worked with the people here in Akureyri to close the institution. And that is how I got to know the people here, including Kitty. And then um, when he um, contacted me about around the time I, I returned to Iceland, and um, he told me that they had decided to gather the most dangerous and most behaviorally challenged, if you can say that, people in Akureyri and that he was going to be uh, head of the program. I just thought, this is a, such a terrible, terrible idea. This cannot end well. And I thought, there's only one man in the world that I know that can really help prevent this from being a disaster, and that is Dan Hobbs. And so I suggested Dan Hobbs would come to Iceland. And so here, here we are all. <laughs> all the Dan Hobbses are here. <laughs> 
So, and that is 25 years ago. But when I came back to Iceland from Syracuse, it was not very easy. There was no research and scholarship in disability. I mean, there were some physicians maybe looking into what was uh, biologically wrong with people who had labels, but there were no social research in disability. And there was no, the authorities um, had no interest. The head of the disability issues in our Ministry of Social Affairs at the time said, research is something that we do not, um, we cannot afford. I wanted to say research is something you cannot afford not to do, but she was not interested. But the disabled people's organizations were interested in uh, research and scholarship also to promote their cause and strengthen their um, campaigns and advocacy. So it has taken a long, long time to develop scholarly competence and build knowledge base around um, disability and disability, disabled people's lives in Iceland. But I think we have come quite a far way and there are now a number of people um, who are doing um, research and collaborating with people outside um, the university. And um, many people think that scholarship and theories are not very practical, but I tell you, we need to have a sound knowledge base for what we do. Nobody would build a bridge without knowing if it will really carry the cars or whatever. But in the field of disability and many other fields, um, we make changes without having any idea, really, what or have any sound knowledge base to, to base our changes on. So I think this is very, very important. So um, much of my energy since I returned has been on combining um, uh, disability studies. In the beginning, I could not work in disability. There was no disability within the university except maybe in the medical school. So I had to start working in other areas and, and then go on to disability. So in the beginning I did women's studies and um, multicultural studies. That's another story. But I, I really tried to create knowledge space um, for work in, with disabled people. And most recently uh, my energy has focused on combining disability studies and human rights law, disability human rights, um, to try to promote um, and support social justice and change. And there is actually a strong international collaboration around this area. And the group I work with is partly um, the disabled um, scholars and activists who took part in uh, drafting the uh, Human Rights, the Disability Treaty, the uh, Convention um, on the Rights of um, Persons with Disabilities. And um, I think disability studies and human rights law are important combination to work toward implementing the CRPD. And this brings me really to the um, to the issues I wanted to share with you today. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which I will refer to as either the Convention or the CRPD. How many people here know about the CRPD? Everyone knows about the CRPD, don't they? Yeah. But um, I, I would like to go into some of the background and um, talk about the content and the guiding principles of the CRPD and how disability is articulated or understood in the convention. And then I will go um, to gentle teaching and I will briefly go over the key elements of gentle teaching and, and um, try to answer the question, how does gentle teaching fit within the framework of the convention? And what kind of role can gentle teaching have in implementing the CRPD? And then I'll have some conclusion, uh, concluding remarks. 
So um, the background to the CLPD is that um, around the globe, um, disabled people are those who are the most likely to be poor, isolated, marginalized, and find it most difficult to enjoy full human rights. Um, this used to be considered as a natural and unavoidable um, consequence of physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments that people had. And so that um, the cause of the marginalized situation of disabled people and the cure for it was regarded as an individual problem. We focused on the abnormal individual and tried to fix him or her. That's how we addressed disability issues. And that is actually how disability issues are addressed um, still in uh, many parts of the world. So systematic discrimination has um, isolated and excluded um, disabled people from participation in society. And they have been pitied, they have been uh, object of charity, they've been viewed as a burden on family, on society, um, and their lives are usually regarded, or very often regarded, as a personal tragedy. So the development has been from this um, emphasis on charity and welfare, which I often see as a, has a very char, you know, it's very loaded, the sort of charity uh, thinking, to a human rights perspective. And uh, there has been um, a growing demand for a treaty, a human rights treaty, that could ensure the full human rights for disabled people. And um, a treaty which reflected um, a new understanding of disability that has been developing um, internationally for the past few decades. So why a, <laughs> a new human rights treaty? Disabled people are covered by all the human rights treaties that have been passed. However, it is very, it's very clear that these existing human rights instrument, instruments, they have failed to effectively protect disabled people. And there was a study done by Gerard Quinn and Theresia Degener that looked at the human rights instruments of the UN, and they looked at how have they addressed disabled people. And um, the conclusion was they have not. And this study was done in 2002. And these findings of the study were one of the reasons why um, um, the UN system agreed to work on a specific human rights treaty that was focused on disabled people in particular. So there were to be no new human rights, but um, the convention um, attempted to overcome this problem that the current human rights in instruments did not um, um, protect uh, the, the human rights of um, disabled people, that it would ensure that persons with disabilities were seen as people who were right bearers who had the same human rights as others. <coughs> and that would be made visible by a specific human rights treaty. And the CRPD also um, tailors and applies traditional human rights to some of the specific human rights problems of disabled people, like um, the freedom of speech. What about people who do not speak in the most conventional manner? What about their freedom of speech? What about the self-determination of people who have difficulties articulating their preferences and wishes? So the treaty addresses issues like this that are specific to disabled people and should assist disabled people to have the same freedom of speech and same um, self-determination as other people, despite their um, impairments. And also, 
the CRPD should um, result in um, increased capacity in human rights um, institutions or um, to, um, so that they would more effectively um, be able to respond to human rights um, issues with regard to disabled people. For example, the human rights offices um, around the world, most of them have not focused on disabled people and there is not, no knowledge in there about disability issues. So this new human rights treaty places um, on them the obligation to look at the human rights of disabled people and not ignore, um, ignore them. So it's interesting how much we ignore disability impairments, disabled people, because disabled people are the world's largest minority and it's actually the only minority group that all of us can join at any time and all of us will join at a certain age if we can reach that age. So if not for other reasons than self-serving reasons, we should treat disabled people well, really. Any of us can have a disabled child tomorrow. You know, anyone can become disabled. We are very fragile as bodies and minds. You know, we, we can all break down. You know, we fall down the stairs. We, I mean, the, people become sick. So, um, it's really amazing how little attention sort of is paid to make sure that disabled people are treated well. So the United Nations has usually estimated that 10% of the world's population uh, have, have some kind of an impairment. And that's about 650 uh, million people, billion people, million. Yeah, there is a, an error on the next uh, issue. And the World Health Organization estimates this to be 15%. And that's their new estimation in um, a World Report on Disability that was um, published um, in 2011. And uh, the, um, the, the link is um, on the slide. And I, I will leave the slides so they can be uploaded and accessible for everyone who would like. This is not evenly distributed over the world. The vast majority of, of um, disabled people are in the so-called third world or developing um, countries. But uh, the CRPD is intended to make it possible for this world's largest minority group to claim full human rights. So it was a very historical moment um, when the CRPD was um, uh, accepted by the UN uh, General Assembly on the 13th of December in 2006. So this year, um, the committee on the CRPD, which is the committee that oversees and monitors the implementation of the convention around the world, they celebrated um, a 10 year anniversary of the convention in Geneva and I was fortunate enough to be there. And they have a videos on the, on the UN web, which is on here, um, where they encourage the countries that have not ratified the convention to do so during the 10 year anniversary of the convention. So on the on 30th of March um, in uh, the 2007, uh, the convention opened for signatures, and that day, 120 states and the European Union uh, signed the treaty. Or never in the history of the UN have so many um, countries signed the treaty on its opening day for signatures, which really reflects the, the worldwide support behind this treaty. And it took um, effect, came into effect, in May 2008, when 20 states had ratified. So if we look at an international uh, overview of where the treaty stands now, and then um, we can see that there is a strong international support for the treaty. 
uh, it was both during its um, drafting within the UN um, system and also um, after it was accept accepted by the General Assembly. And the CRPD has been signed and ratified by the vast majority of countries internationally. On the 11th of May, which is the latest um, information on the UN web, then 160 countries had signed the treaty and 164 had ratified. And the difference between signing and ratifying is that if you, you sign the treaty with the intent that you're going to ratify it, and then by signing, you should not do anything. You not, should not take any actions that are against the treaty. If you ratify the treaty, you um, are committed to implementing it within your state. And then there are certain rules about um, the implementation. And so uh, the UN has 193 member states, so you can see that there is a large majority that has ratified. But I must sadly say that Iceland, who signed on the opening day of signatures, has not ratified yet. And uh, neither has the US. So, this is uh, from, the, um, from the UN web, and it shows um, internationally uh, who has signed. Also, there is an optional protocol that um, also always um, is a part of these UN treaties. And the optional protocol, if a country ratifies the optional protocol, it means that if, you are, if your human rights under that treaty are violated within um, your country and after you have exhausted all possibilities to, to ratify that, you can take your um, case to the UN committee. So it's very important that Iceland ratifies the option, optional protocol too. So, uh, the only thing I can say is that um, there is a lack of um, political will and interest in Iceland, and um, which is very sad in this area, and which reflects in the, the fact that um, the convention has not been ratified. But the way to ratify it in Iceland is to, um, uh, to take it into Icelandic law. I'm not going to go into the system why, but it will not have an effect in Iceland unless it's accepted as law in Iceland. That's just the Icelanders have to know and advocate for that kind of um, ratification. Okay, the convention is, um, of the, is sometimes called the convention of many firsts because um, it was the first UN human rights treaty of the 21st century. It's the first convention that has been adopted with full and very direct participation of those it concerns. Disabled people are very, very active in uh, drafting and, um, and um, creating the convention. It's the first treaty that outlines the obligations of states to implement. It's Article 33 that has very clear um, guidelines on what states need to do and how they should implement. It's, uh, it's very unusual, uh, the first treaty that does that, very interesting. It's the first human rights treaty that allows for continuous national oversight, overview, you know, following of the human rights situation in that area. It's the first UN treaty that has headings. Usually it's just Article 3, Article 5, Article whatever. The, uh, the articles in the convention all have headings that indicate what the article is about, like access to justice, whatever. And um, they, that is done to make it more um, accessible for those who want to use it. And it's the first human rights treaty, <coughs> excuse me, to be signed and ratified by the European Union. And that's quite significant for those of us who live um, in Europe because it means that the EU has to implement a treaty within its own system 
and it creates also quite a bit of pressure on member states. Unfortunately, we are not member state, but so it's important. <clears throat> so the key, one key element of the CRPD is this new understanding of disability. <coughs> disability rejects this um, medical and biological understanding of disability um, as an individual pro problem that resides or is within the person. Instead, disability is seen as a social creation and a societal problem resulting from the fact that society has failed to take into consideration the real diversity of human beings and um, has really um, not welcomed everyone. So um, it is society that needs to change, not disabled people. Up until now, we have focused very much on changing disabled people. Now it's we who need to change, the society that needs to change. And the CRPD suggests ways in which such change can be brought about. And for the first time, human rights of disabled people are central, um, are of central importance in international efforts to promote, protect, and fulfill human rights. Before, disabled people were not seen as um, object or as um, the focus of human rights, but of welfare and, you know, things like that. So this is how um, the CRPD um, articulates um, disability in its preamble. And disability results from the interaction between persons with impairments, on the one hand, and attitudinal and um, environmental barriers that hinder their full and effective um, participation in society on an equal basis with others. So it's a wide-ranging human rights treaty with an explicit social development dimension. One of the reasons why it was passed through the UN system so quickly was that it focused on the poorest of the poor <clears throat> in most countries. And the UN system has very, been very focused on um, getting people out of poverty, and disabled people are the poorest of the poor. So this was seen as many leaders in many countries that usually do not support necessarily disability rights. And the, the poverty issue was a big um, reason for many. And um, yeah, and it clarifies um, how all categories of rights, civil, political, and political rights, economic, cultural, and social rights um, apply to persons with disabilities and identifies areas where adap adaptations have to be made for persons with disabilities to effectively exercise their rights. Uh, the CRPD is a very large and complicated, has over 50 um, articles, but Article 3 lays out the guiding principles of the Convention. And when, if you work with the um, Convention, <clears throat> you should look to these guiding principles when interpreting other articles of the treaty. <clears throat> and so it's, the first principle is respect for inherent dignity, individual autonomy, <clears throat> including the freedom uh, to make one's own choices and independence of um, persons. Uh, Non-discrimination, full and effective um, participation and inclusion in society, respect for the difference and acceptance, respect for difference and acceptance of persons with disabilities as a part of human diversity and humanity. And this is, for me, a very, very key issue, that disabled people are not abnormal people. They are a part of um, normal human diversity. This is how we are. It's not that some people are normal or some abnormal. Disabled people are a part of human diversity. 
And it's a very, very important um, principle that's laid out there. Equality of opportunity, accessibility, equality between men and women, and respect for the evolving cap capacities of children with disabilities and respect for the right of children with disabilities to preserve their identities. There are actually two groups that are highlighted in particular in the convention, and it's women and their multiple um, discrimination as on the basis of gender and on the basis of disability, and um, a specific focus on children. Um, so, in implementing um, the convention, um, the convention itself very much focuses on the government level. Um, there are two articles um, of the convention that outline the obligations regarding implementing um, the CRPD in each country, and it has more details in that area than any other um, human rights treaty. The emphasis is very much on um, involving um, disabled people and their organizations in impl implementing and monitoring the treaty, just as um, disabled people are very active in drafting the treaty, they should also be very active in implementing and monitoring. And um, these obligations um, are heavily focused on governmental instruments and institutions regarding policy legislation and monitoring. But um, we also need to implement um, the disability treaty on a personal level and in everyday life. And a number of articles of um, the treaty focus on fundamental human rights issues that are very crucial in disabled people's everyday lives, but which often have been violated. And these are issues such as respect for the inherent dignity and individual freedom of each person, self-determination, Article 12 is a very important article which focuses on that. Non-discrimination, it is not um, legal to discriminate um, on the basis of disability. Equality, access to justice, um, inclusion, participation, and the right to live in the community. Some actually have argued that um, this is a new right, the right to live in the community. You know, the sort of mantra is um, there are new, no new rights in this treaty. But some have argued that this um, uh, Article 19 that talks about the right to live in the community is, introduces a new right. The lawyers argue over such things. Uh, respect for difference and acceptance of disabled people as a part of human diversity. Freedom from exploitation, violence, and abuse, and freedom from cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or treatment or punishment, and that is, in my view, where behavior modification rings um, alarming bells because uh, international research and international monitoring has sometimes seen that as inhuman, deg uh, degrading, and uh, treatment and punishment, and um, respect for privacy. So now let's turn to gentle teaching. I'm not going to say very much about gentle teaching, because probably most of you in here know more about gentle teaching and are more experienced than I am. <coughs> but I'm just going to go through some of the key elements so that I can see how gentle teaching and the new Human Rights Convention sort of fit together. So gentle teaching is an attitude as well as a method. Um, it includes principles that are integrated into everyday life and daily relationships. And here's a quote I took from one of the um, um, text on, on, um, on um, on gentle teaching, it says, every human being needs to live connected with others 
in an equal and reciprocal relationship um, and embedded in a loving and caring community. And um, in many places, um, people who write about gentle teaching say that it is about teaching a person the feeling of companionship um, in a non-domineering way, non-violent um, approach. And these four pillars that um, are all over the gentle teaching literature, feeling safe with each other, feeling loved by each other, feeling loving towards each other, and feeling connected with each other. These are the pillars of, um, and sort of some of the key elements of, of gentle teaching. And so how do these key elements of general teaching fit within the framework of the convention. When I look at the essence of gentle teaching, what I see is res respect for the person, no, a non-violent approach, which is an incredibly important approach because all research, both my personal research and the research that have been done internationally, show that um, Disabled people, especially disabled women and disabled children, are experience violence to a much, much higher degree than any other groups in society. So the non-violent approach is an incredibly important approach. And creating safe spaces, that is also very important because not only do disabled people experience violence and abuse and coercion, they are also um, very often um, subject to this sort of what is called microaggressions, like this small, no, you can't do that. No, you have to do that. No, you shouldn't eat that. No, you, you know, these are small microaggressions that disabled people experience many times a day and seems to be, you know, much too. So feeling safe or, and creating safe spaces is, an, is also very, very um, important. And when we talk to Icelandic women um, about violence and abuse they have experienced, much of it is um, institutionalized abuse or system abuse, where the system really is organized in a way that's very coercive for them. And they talked very much about having a safe space where they could express themselves um, in a way that they knew they were not, um, you know, criticized for, and they could safely talk about the issues that were of importance for them without having um, all kinds of people around that kept correcting them or not understanding them and not really follow them. Um, acceptance of the person, um, loving and equal relationships and companionships, inclusion um, in a loving uh, community, and loving attention to the person's wishes and needs. I think that's a very, very important issue. And then, uh, you know, I'm thinking about if you really love someone, if you are really close to someone, you pay this kind of attentive love to the person's need. Not just on a superficial manner, but both with the little details and the important bigger issues about meaningful activities to the day, during the day, health, good health care, you know, uh, so, and also to the little things that are unique to each person and makes, their, um, makes this contact um, uh, special. So, and the emphasis on interdependence as well as independence. And with the current emphasis on independent living, um, people do not know that Ed Roberts, who is seen as the father or godfather of independent living, he talked a lot about interdependence, not just independence. So I think it's very important. We are all interconnected and interdependent. 
So I think all of these um, key um, aspects of gentle teaching, the essence of gentle teaching, are very much in line with the key elements of the convention. And uh, it was very rewarding, I thought, to go through this and find this um, good fit. So what should the role of gentle teaching be in implementing um, the convention? Um, I must say that um, most service systems and service programs around the world are stuck in a very institutionalized way of serving and supporting disabled people. I would even go so far as to say that uh, the majority of the human service system is bankrupt. The, the methods that are used, they, they are not effective, they are not working. And we have closed the institutions and I have taken great part in the struggle to close um, institutions that were terrible. But we have created little institutions instead. We, we have created um, new services, but we have brought a lot of the institutional practices to the new services. So, so that even if people are living in an apartment cluster, they have their own apartment, it's the same institutionalized way of providing support and services. So we have a long way to go. And the institution is not just a big house. It is a practice that we still practice. We still practice the institution in our many of our small um, services. So I think there is um, a great need um, to develop new ways of supporting um, disabled people. And many people, including in Iceland, are working very hard to find these ways, new ways, that respect disabled people's inherent dignity and empowers them to claim their rights and take part in all aspects of the life of their communities on an equal basis with others. So I don't want to belittle the efforts that have been undertaken. But overall, the picture is not good. And I think that um, gentle teaching as an approach and the method is one of the ways that can truly play a strong and an important role in implementing the promise of the CLPD. Because it's a very different approach than is usually practiced within the services. So implementing um, and monitoring the CLPD is incredibly complex. Because it's on a multi-level sort of, it's a multi-level governance of this treaty. Uh, we have the UN international level where there is a committee on the CLPD um, that oversees the implementation. After countries ratify, they have to send a report and um, go and introduce the report to the committee and the committee says, you know, gives comments and stuff like that. The committee has also uh, given out a few general comments about how to interpret particular um, articles of the convention. The latest comment, general comment, was about education. You will find all of this on the UN web. And, um, and the, the EU uh, multinational level, um, EU also um, implements the CLPD on its level. And then we have the national level. In many countries there are regional offices or service systems that need to implement the CLPD. And then we have its munis municipality. And then we have the personal level, which is usually skipped when people talk about the implementation and monitoring. But I think that the everyday, everyday interactions and relationships are equally important as the UN um, um, committee. And the CRPD needs to be implemented at all of these levels. 
And one of the most challenging is perhaps the personal level. And that is where really I see gentle teaching being able to um, play an important role. So in conclusion, I th in my view and many other people's view, uh, the CLPD is really a landmark. It brings an historical opportunity for change on many, many levels. And it's the first time that um, all of these levels are focused on the human rights of disabled people. So it is a very important thing. But it's only important if we implement it properly. Um, it is really a paradigm shift in how we think about disability. Um, and it's a rallying point. We can all rally together on an inter on an together to try to implement this treaty. It can unite us in pulling in the same direction, all of us. The last time we had something that we rallied around internationally, and it was when the principles of normalization were introduced. I think the principle of normalization um, were incredibly important. Well, I'm not going to go into them now. So, but now we have a new thing that can um, unite us and we can work together um, towards. And um, like I say, this change only, can only happen if the treaty is properly implemented. And people have to know the treaty to implement it. And um, I worry a lot that people don't know what the treaty stands for. It's very complicated, so, but, um, okay. So the key elements of gentle teaching have very much in common with the human rights approach and promise of the CRPD. And um, I think um, it is not least because of the emphasis on our common human interdependence and our need to be loved, loving, safe, and connected that has the potential to bring about the change that all of us and our societies need to undergo in order to create um, social justice for us all and make the world a loving um, and a safe community. And um, I must emphasize that I say to bring about the change in all of us, not change disabled people. We have to change. We all have to change. And that is the key of gentle teaching, not changing disabled people, but that we have to change together and we all have to change to make the world the kind of place that is good for all of us. And so I am very, very pleased to have um, been a part of bringing gentle teaching to Iceland. And I sincerely hope that it continues to grow and make us all better people. Thank you.